you know right away at the opening of the film that that Anna goes to jail for this. And she's so clearly convinced that she and Derek really had a a love affair. I I didn't set out to make a film that was shocking. You know, that's not what interested me about the film. That was one big element I was interested in the beginning as to what degree do we all project onto the person we're with, right? I mean, to, to what degree are we with the person, the real person who is the other person? And to what degree are we with or hoping to be with the person that we, we want them to be? And, and, and how that confusion leads to so much turmoil and conflict in some relationships. I watched this and, and Nick, as I've said to you, one of the things that so impressed me was that though, you know, you, I think you, you know right away at the opening of the film that, that Anna goes to jail for this. And, uh, you know, it's, it's very shocking when Derek is first on the camera, you know, oh, this is the person she did this with, you know. And yet you, you do such a good job in the film, I think, of giving her a voice. And she's so clearly convinced, uh, you know, that, that she and Derek really had a, a love affair. Um, and, and you just do a wonderful job of holding open that space that um you know it, i didn't i didn't feel uh i didn't feel sure about what i thought until toward the end um and and i think that once you do get to the end there is there is a lot of outrage you know there is like how the you know how the heck could she do that what was she thinking um my god how naive i mean there's there's a there's a i can just kind of feel that in myself and i'm sure in the kind of discourse around the film there's just like a lot of shock you know that that she would she would do this because um you know she did she did you know bring him to her office and and uh and have sex with him so um but but i what i was left with what was reverberating for me was as someone in the helping profession, how aware I am of how susceptible we all are to what we would call countertransference, our own kind of thoughts and fantasies about the person that we're working with. And all of us, but especially those of us in the helping professions, um, can be susceptible to developing a savior complex, which can uh, really um, uh, distort reality for us. So I, I found myself, you know, horrified and shocked, but at the same time thinking, wait a minute, <laughs> I, I know that place too. I think it's essential for me as a filmmaker that people ask themselves those questions. You know, I was starting to say um, before we hit record that, you know, um, I, I didn't set out to make a film that was shocking. You know, that's not what interested me about the film. What interested me about the film was that it was a, uh, an extreme human experience that had a lot to reveal about our own potential and, and you know, um, down to <laughs> the, just the very idea of relationships and love, right? That was one big element I was interested in the beginning as to what degree do we all project onto the person we're with, right? I mean, to, to what degree are we, are we yeah. with, with the person, the real person who is the other person? And to what degree are we with or hoping to be with the person that we, we want them to be? And 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 how that confusion leads to so much turmoil and conflict in some relationships, you know, not speaking personally, of course, I don't have any of those problems. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> but, um, but, you know, I was, I was interested in it for those reasons. There's a reasons why we have all the mythology around that, too. You know, I, I thought about Pygmalion, you know, uh, very early on. I was like, well, if this is, you know, if this is a love, a love story in quotes, right, what kind of a love story is it? it, it and... Um, I went in with a real open mind and a lot of curiosity about it because I thought it had the story had so many things to teach us all. And sometimes when you take extreme stories, you know, it's a little bit easier to kind of see the kind of tentacles of those stories dangling in our lives and, and how easy it might be to, to latch on to one of them and get to a place that we never imagined we might get to, you know, if we're not, if we're sort of not careful or thoughtful or checking in with ourselves and, and, and others. And, I think what happened in this case also was that they kept, you know, the relationship was very private, right? Um, 
yes. for so long. And in that privacy, which lasted almost two years, you know, privacy and, and, and the sort of secretive nature of it can be a context for, for all kinds of, of things to start happening that may or may not have been there, right? It's such a good point of uh, just that one-on-one -on -one relationship in any kind of a, a helping profession. Uh, you, it, it, the analogy that Jung uses is that you put the, the two people, their personalities, in an alchemical vase. And if, if the elements combine, uh, both people are changed. Uh, and people bring their own projections, their own complexes, the helper, especially in this case, because Derek was so impaired, he could not speak. Uh, and uh, so in a way, he's uh, very much a blank screen, which creates the conditions. Uh, for projection. Right. I mean, I think, um, you know, it's interesting. He's, if we, if we just, <laughs> it gets very complicated, you know, especially when you get into the, the disability side of it, because he was, he could, you know, he could not communicate verbally. Right. And I think it's just really important to sort of remind people that, you know, Deva Kastnitz, who's one of the people in the film who is a, she has a, something called torsion dystonia, and she's one of the main characters in the film. She was at trial. She uh, has a, a, a PhD. She taught in, in Berkeley for many, many years. You know, she would say the majority of our communication is nonverbal anyway, right? And, and she wasn't saying that as a way to sort of um, let everybody off the hook, but it was just to make the point that, you know, let's just make sure we understand that the, the, the how, how fundamental uh, and verbal communication is to our perception of reality, right? But that, that's one layer of it. And I'm only saying that, which is to say that, you know, Derek, as much as he is a blank slate, he is also a full and sort of total person of his own, right? That is bringing um, a very different kind of life experience to the table. And, and that produces I its own alchemy as as what you're saying that is quite different than the one that we're used to right and and um so I, I i only say that not as a sort of like a correction but just to sort of say that um you know he was bringing things to the table and i as a filmmaker am also interested in that that mystery right and i had i had a i had a dis disability consultant who was a he was a black artist and advocate from san francisco also with cerebral palsy and he helped remind me that part of what we were trying to understand was what did Derek experience? What did he bring to the table? Whether he was intellectually impaired or not, what, ex what did he feel from this? That's an important question that I think audiences are left in the film is what did he experience? Yeah. What was your sense of that after your exploration and consultation with an expert of Derek's experience? You know, I think even, even I would only quote uh, the film, um, there's a gentleman, Howard Shane, who uh, assesses Derek for trial and determines that he, you know, could probably did not have the ability to type and, to, and didn't have the, uh, I, sorry, I should say did not have the intellect to type, um, but had the physical ability to type. That's sort of an interesting thing in, in, in and of itself. But he would say, you know, I don't, he wouldn't claim to know what Derek was experiencing. I don't think he would ever assess that. I think everyone, you know, what he, I think, did correctly was stay in his lane, which was as a clinician, he was very much testing for very particular things. You know, can this, does this person have the ability to use a device? And, and that's all. He stopped there and he stopped short of making any assumptions about what, what might have occurred and what level of, of consent, if any, there was that was not expressed. And I would sort of, you know, it's not to sort of cop out, uh, you know, or, 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 you know, but I, I would sort of, I would plead the fifth as well on making a statement about what he was experiencing. I don't think that's fair of me. You know, I think that's a question I want people to, I want, I want it to bother people, you know, at the end of the film, I wanted to agitate people, you know. That was uh, remarkably and poignantly successful.
Uh, it, is, it is a very agitating film, and necessarily so. The, the polarities are not resolved. Right. And uh, the film challenges us to hold all these tensions uh, about race and consent and disability and power and communication, and all of it leaves us, I think, really wrestling with all these questions instead of the, you know, the false comfort of here are the answers, the answers. Correct. Uh, it, and Lisa made a point earlier on that I think is really salient, which is um, let's think about where all these issues reside in us around power and consent, communication, projection, because of, you know, what Jung says is that we first get to know someone in, in many life dynamics through projection. That's, our, that's what draws us to someone or to an experience. And then hopefully we can reflect and differentiate between that person or that experience and self rather than merging with it uh, as Anna may have done. And, and that's very much part of analytic training of what's me and what is the you who sits in our consulting room. Mm -hmm.